Thank you, Jesus, for another day and for your grace and mercy and for your loving kindness towards us. These are the words of Gloria Thompson. Gloria is joining us this evening for your health and you on our YouTube platform. Welcome one and all to your health and you. I'm your host, Anjui Jane Sawyers, and it is indeed a blessing to be here this evening. And we are so very happy to have you with us. If you are on our Facebook page, welcome. And for those of you who are on our Zoom platform, a special welcome to you as well. Now, we want to say a word of prayer before we go any further into our program. Let us bow our heads and welcome the Holy Spirit with us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for your everlasting love towards us. We want to thank you that we can be still and we can know that you are God. We also want to thank you that we can also be still and hold our peace as you fight our battles for us. We also want to give you thanks that you are exalted among the heathen and you are also exalted among the nations. We give you thanks and praises that you are sovereign, you are omnipresent, you are omnipotent, and you are omniscient. You know all things, you are all powerful, and you are ever present. We thank you for your health message that you have given unto us in order for us to prosper in health. We thank you for this desire that you have for us and also for us to prosper in all things. We pray that you will be with those who will be joining us for our program this evening. We thank you for ordering their steps to this platform and we pray that we will all receive the nourishment that we have come in store for for this evening. We pray for all the participants. We ask for your covering. We ask for your blessing. We ask for your guidance. We ask for your protection. And we also ask for your power to rain down on us. We thank you for what you will be doing in us and through us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, so I'm seeing that we have some other persons joining us on YouTube. Welcome, Sister Elaine. Welcome, Sister Marvel. And welcome, Joan and Charmaine. Sister Joan says, a pleasant evening to you all, my brethren and friends. God is good. Yes, God is good. And he is good all the time. Amen. We are going to turn to our anchor text at this time. So get your Bibles out. We are turning to the book of Genesis. That's the very first book of the Bible. And we are going to chapter one and we will be reading verse 29. That's Genesis one, verse 29. And it says, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Here ends a portion of God's holy word. Now we have. Clarendon leading out in our program for this evening. And we, of course, will have a presentation on a health-related topic for you. The information will be evidence-based and we will be having a mini quiz and also a cooking class that we call Deliciously Vegan. 
we also will be having special prayer this evening. And of course, Facts with Hope and a Celebrations video. Now we invite you to let us know where you are watching or listening to us from. And we also encourage you, if this is your first time with us, to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And also you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at, at CJCSDA. We would also love if you would share this video with someone. Now, if you have a favorite Bible text, or spirit of prophecy reading related to the ministry of food, we want you to share that with us in the chat. If you have prayer requests as well, we invite you to share them in the chat. If you are not feeling so comfortable with sharing the details of your request, you can also put uh, the prayer emoji. Yes, the prayer emoji in the chat. We will see the hands and we will see the requests and our team will be praying on your behalf. Now, our moderator for this evening is a doctor. Her name is Simone Chung. Dr. Chung is a medical doctor and she's a general practitioner in a private practice in Spalding Clarendon. She has a passion for the treatment of health conditions, including their prevention and reversal. She's married to Dr. Stephen Chung and together they have three children. She is a trained health promoter of the Adventist health message and believes in the eight laws that the eight laws of health which she uses along with modern medicine in her daily practice. Now, as Dr. Chung moderates the program, if you have questions, we also encourage you to put them in the chat. So I now turn over to Dr. Simone Chung. Thank you so much, Anjali. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to your health and you, Clarendon. We're always happy to host this program. And if you have ever wondered how to garden when you only have a small space, or you have wondered how to do it without pesticides, pesticides, because we all know how dangerous these things can be to us, again, you are in the right place. Because tonight, you're gonna learn about how to choose the right medium to grow your plants, and how to care for your crops, how to manage, your, manage pests, and how to harvest. Now, I'm going to do a little reading for you right now from Ministry of Healing, pages 295 and 296. Just a little excerpt. And listen, our bodies are built from the food we eat. There is constant breaking down of the tissues of the body. Every movement of every organ involves waste, and this waste is repaired from our food. Those foods should be chosen that best supply elements needed for building up the body. In this choice, appetite is not a safe guide. In order to know what are the best foods, we must study God's original plan for man's diet. He who created man and who understands his needs appointed Adam his food. Behold, he said, I give you every herb yielding seed in every tree, in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for food. And that leads us to our quiz questions. So you're gonna type your answers into the chat. And Angie, look out for these answers. When we study God's original plan for man's diet, what are the four foods that constitute this original diet chosen by the creator? And while you type those answers into the chat, I'm gonna tell you about our disclaimer. The information shared in this series is for health education only. It is not intended to use as medical advice. It should not be used to diagnose or treat any illness, a disease, or health problem. You're encouraged to seek out a medical doctor or healthcare professional to provide you with any concern you may have for your physical, mental, or emotional health. So tell me, Andrew, are any answers coming in for a little quiz? Any answers? I'm not seeing any answers just yet, Dr. Chung, but as soon as I see 
any response, I will let you know. So we could go ahead now with our celebrations nutrition video and see what answers come in in that time. Celebrations Nutrition. There's no life without food. Food contains all the nutrients essential for health. Yet sometimes we fail to remind ourselves of this fact and end up eating unhealthy food or not enough healthy food. But shouldn't we try our best to celebrate every meal with healthful food choices? In order to better select the food you eat, you must first understand how nutrition works. Our bodies get nutrients from food through the process of digestion. The nutrients your body needs include carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and more. Consuming the right balance of these nutrients is fundamental to a healthy life. So that leads back to the topic of food choices. When selecting foods to eat, some factors you should take into account are variety, quality, balance, moderation, and avoidance. When you evaluate your food choices based on sound principles, you increase your chances of feeding your body food that will really make you healthier. A healthful diet increases your quality of life. Celebrate nutrition by appropriately enjoying the many products of the earth that God has given to you. Choose a balanced plant-based diet and enjoy a healthier and more abundant life. Okay, so what are answers coming in, Angie? What are the answers? What are they saying? I see Dr. Chong. One moment. Ingrid Williams. She says fruit, not vegetable grain. And I'm seeing some other responses coming in. This is Miss Bill 100. She says fruit and vegetables. Debbie Ann Armstrong, nuts, grains, vegetables. Elaine Bryan, grains, seeds, fruits, nuts. Maureen Thomas, seeds, grains, fruits, and vegetables. Marva Graham, fruit, grain, and nuts. Elaine Tomlinson, fruits, grains, and nuts, etc., and vegetables. And that rounds up the responses to the question. Thank you. Some very good responses. So grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our creator. And let me add a little note to say nothing else. Anything else that falls outside of this will not give your body anything healthful to live on or to sustain it or to create um, new cells or to remove toxins. Those are the only foods that should be in your diet. I know that I am stirring controversy when I say it. Some people say, wow, can that be true? It is totally true. And now at this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our resource person of the night. His name is Elder Fitzroy White, and Fitzroy White is a Jamaican national. He is a health promoter and an avid gardener, and he's an elder at the Kencott SDA Church. So after graduating from the, from the College of Agriculture in Portland with an associate of science, Fitzroy joined the government service in the Ministry of Agriculture in 1991. He subsequently earned a postgraduate diploma in agriculture and rural development from the University of the West Indies. He served in the plant quarantine branch for 27 years and served on many committees relating directly and indirectly to plant health. So he probably the saying, let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. Welcome, 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 Elder Fitzroy White. Welcome to your health in your Clemdon. Thank you very much, Doc. And it's a pleasure for me to be joining you this evening to share in your health and you program. And I, I am very excited because by now, I think we've had, um, this is about the fourth presentation I'm doing um, with this um, gardening in small spaces, I call it um, the organic way. And what we want is for our church members to recognize that we can supplement our foods by doing a little of it in whatever space we have. So we're going to be looking at then organic gardening for people with small spaces. 
and you will notice um, that there is a logo at the bottom of the screen and our friend Dr. Lamley had me do this presentation for her um, last year. So I have just um, done a few changes to it to fit within the time frame that we have on your program. So we'll be looking at um, the overview shows that we'll be looking at a small a little introduction, um, what organic gardening is, site selection, growing medium, that is what we're going to be growing our plants in, planting material, crop care, and a little look at pest management and touch on the favorite of most people, harvesting. Many of us love to harvest while we didn't plant. And uh, however, that's the fact of life, but we should try to plant something that we can enjoy the fulfillment of watching it grow and eating it. So this practical gardening course is designed for the health conscious person who recognize the need to supplement their fruits and vegetable needs by growing a portion of, it in their food, of their food in a simple home garden. So I want us to recognize that the Lord desires people to move into the country where they can settle on land and raise their own food and vegetable fruits and vegetables, and where their children can be brought in direct contact with the works of God in nature. So the counsel is take your families away from the cities. This is the message for this time. And that's from the book selected messages. So what we recognize is that many of us won't be able to move away from the cities because of various intervening situations. But of course we can grow a portion of what we eat um, wherever we are. And if you follow me closely and take some notes, you can see what I mean. So what we want you to do is to recognize that you can use what, 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 what um, we, we, we want you to recognize that there's a little square foot that can be used or a square of any size that you, that you have space to design can be used to grow a few vegetables, mostly that you can enjoy from time to time. So the aim of this course is for you to be equipped, yes, to do a square foot gardening or for you to use various pots and pans, buckets, whatever is available that is safe to use to grow your own fruits or, or, or even your vegetables. What you're seeing on the screen here is, is somewhat I have been using in the past. So what I'm sharing with you is not something is not rocket science. It's something that you can do. You just need to put a little time in it. Okay. So the objective of this garden of the course is, or the organic farming rather, is a system that is ecologically friendly. It uses natural pest to con pest control methods and biological fertilizers derived largely from animal and plant waste and nitrogen fixing crops. Now, some might say we would not be talking about animal waste, but if your animal is fed just natural things like the cows that graze on grass without any chemicals being in it, or your chickens in your yard, these droppings can be used as fertilizers and then there are other crops that we can use the leaves and the stem and the barks and the cuttings to make fertilizers that we use. So that's why we are saying it's largely derived from animals and plant waste. And then we talk about nitrogen fixing cover crops, which is another discussion, but just learn that there are some plants that while they're growing, they're adding nutrients to the soil that your growing plants can use. So let's look then at where we are going to be growing our vegetables or fruits. The ideal location should give full sunlight to the plants. Now there are some lights that require 80% um, sunlight for the day, some 70, and based on, 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 on where you place it, you should make sure that it is getting at least 80 to 70% of the day is getting full sunlight. Because plants use, as we know, sunlight to manufacture their food. Even the microbes in the soil need sunlight to thrive and the microbes and the, have a, a, a role to play in making the soil adequate for the roots to be healthy and happy. So the, the thing that we need to do is to check for the site for biological, chemical and physical hazards 
before we plant our garden there. Or if you are going to be taking up the soil to put it in a pot, in a container garden, you should also make sure that it is free from any hazard that can be deleterious to you or any hazard that will hamper the growth of the plant. Okay, so when we're contemplating site selection, the soil should be free draining. That is, we don't want anywhere where when it rains, it holds the water for two, three, four hours. Or if you're going to be putting it in a pot, the pot must have enough holes to allow free drainage. Runoff or contaminated water should not be allowed to enter your garden or use to water your plants. So you should make sure that the water that you're using, if you're getting it from somewhere or if you're storing it, it is not contaminated. I'll give you a quick example. Once upon a time at home here, somebody used some kitchen water from, from washing dishes and so forth and so on to water a lovely tomato plant that we had. And lo and behold, by the next day, the plant was withered. Why? Because the water was contaminated from all the wa washing dishes in it and the oil and the grease and the soap and all of that. So that is an indication. I'm giving you a practical example of how we should not use contaminated water, water plants. So we select an area where wind and rainwater from roofs will not damage the plants or wash away the soil. And even if you're going to be placing your pots or your buckets anywhere, you should make sure that you're not placing them where when the rain falls, it will be running off of your roof or any building that you have around, or even, even if you're placing it on the ground, not where there's a little stream that will be formed when it rains to wash away your soil. Because even if the soil is not washed away, what we call leaching will take place where the nutrients in the soil will be washed out. Okay, so place your contents where wind and rain, water from roofs will not damage your plants. Now, many of us might not be able to grow our plants in the ground because of where we live, but we can do some container gardening. If you're going to do that, soil from the ground or growing medium that you're going to be getting from anywhere to be used as potting mix in your containers must contain enough organic matter. And for plants, we're talking about nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK. That is the major nutrient that plants need. And of course, there are some micronutrients that are in the soil. So we need to make sure that the organic matter or the compost or the manure that we're going to be using has enough of this nutrient to sustain the plants and to help them to fight off diseases. Soil organisms, worms and bacteria also must be plentiful in your growing medium because these, as I said before, help the plant and the soil environment to have the optimum conditions for plants to grow. Worms will be working through the soil, creating air spaces. And as the worms change their skin from time to time, that skin becomes um, fertilizer for the plants. And you have your insects dying in, in there, uh, our changing, molting and all of that. Though those will provide nutrients for the plant. So you want to encourage that to happen by choosing a growing medium that will have optimum conditions for all of this to happen. So if you're going to be mixing your some, some different things to make your growing medium, you may be maybe a mixture of sand, manure, or compost, yes, in order to get your growing medium nice and loose or loamy looking and dark looking. The darker the soil is like the soil that we get from under our trees that have leaves falling and so forth and so on. And it's there for a long time, nice and dark those are normally rich in the nutrients that the plants need. So only properly composted or aged manure must be used in your plant. So if you're going to be making your own compost or you're going to be purchasing compost or manure, make sure it is properly aged before you use it. If it's not properly aged, a number of things can happen. It can damage the plant roots. Also, if it's not properly aged, the nutrients that are in it are not going to be available to your plants, okay? So if you're going to be buying commercial potting mix, 
you might be able to see on the label what it contains and decide whether that is the best thing for you to buy. Again, growing medium should not be compacted and not to be used multiple times without revitalizing. So what I have here at home is this bathtub that I use as one of my, one of my growing areas. And the soil in the bathtub over time will become compacted by your watering it on your planting in it, what you should do is to make sure that you're turning this ever so often so it remains aerated and you're adding organic manure to it so it keeps nice and loamy and loose in your hand, okay? And if you're going to be growing in containers, make sure that maybe after every six or eight months or so, depending on what you're planting in it, you're revitalizing this soil, this the growing medium by adding organic nutrients to it so the plants will always have enough food in it to use what you can also do is not to put plant in the same plant at the same place or in the same pot over and over because plants feed at different layers in the soil and so you will find that different plants will be feeding from different areas of the soil hence you are not depleting the nutrients totally okay and we could discuss that in another forum, how to choose different plants to plant where and when. Okay, so you've selected your area or you've gotten your pots and you've gotten nice growing medium to put in them. What are you going to be planting? So you can plant seeds that you buy from the store. Yes, or you can germinate your own seedlings as shown here in this eggshell. They're germinating what looks like peas, red peas, or string bean, or yard long bean, or you could use cuttings. You could learn how to make your own cuttings from plants to use as your planting material. So if you're going to be starting seeds, there are a number of ways you can do it. You could use anything around the house like this eggshell here, or you could buy the little seed trays that are commercially available, or you could get a flower pot or a bucket that you cut. I, I prefer to use a five gallon bucket. I just fill it up with dirt and use it as my, 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 my seedling spot. And then I transplant from that into where I want the plants to be growing. Okay, so there's a number of ways to do it. And then there are the the, 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 the persons who love to try different things, you can look online or you can remember how your parents used to do it and do those things as well. I give you two examples here. Uh, what I have here in this bucket are lettuce seedlings. Yes. And I water the lettuce seedlings through this pipe in the bucket. So the water is not damaging the seedlings or calling, causing these delicate plants to be falling over. At the bottom is a callaloo stem. So if you buy your callaloo from wherever, from your friend or from the market or wherever, you don't need to worry about getting seeds if you want to start doing your own callaloo. You can make cuttings from the fat callaloo stems that you have, yes, and use these as your planting material. Now, there are some seeds that are big and you don't need to sow them and transplant them, yes? So like corn, peas and beans, pumpkins, cilantro and carrots are exceptions. These are very small seeds and they are so small that it's hard to handle them individually. So you sow these seeds most of the time where you want them to be growing. And as they germinate, you can go and thin it out. So you don't have too many of them growing at the same spot and then competing for nutrients. Okay, now a very important thing to recognize is that if you're buying commercial seeds, you need to pay attention to two things. Dates on the seed packets and the planting material should be disease-free and without deformity. How are you going to know? Well, let's look at the first one, the dates on the seed packets. Now, there is what is called the packed for date and the sell by date, as you're seeing on this packet here. Packed for 2015, meaning in 2016, matter of fact, by October 2015, you should use these seeds. Why is it important? Because after this sell-by date, 
the viability of the seeds have decreased significantly. And so you might be doing your site selection and your land preparation or you're preparing your pots. And when you sow these seeds, the germination rate that you're getting is not what you expected because the viability of the seed would have decreased over time. So you need to pay attention to the, these dates. So you don't waste time and effort in doing your preparation and then you are disappointed. Okay, moving along to crop care, crop care. Uh, let me say something about this picture that we have here. Here I have some escalion in this, in this container and I've had, I've had them in the container for over a year. Why was I able to do that? Because I would be reaping the escalion very often and revitalizing the soil ever like every three or so months to keep nutrients in there. And scallion is a, is a plant. If you continue reaping it, you will just continue sending up new ones. So you'll be always be reaping from this as long as you cure it nicely. So in crop care, you're going to be doing your daily inspection. What are you looking for? Insect damage, slime trail, and signs of diseases. Okay, each of these, you can recognize over as you continue to go and look and inspect. And it is good to inspect your plants daily or if every other day if you can't do it daily. Because what you're doing is you're trying to prevent any disadvantaged plants because of insect slime slugs or disease to be in your garden for any long time. And then those diseases or those pests might move to other plants that that are, were, were not damaged initially. Okay, so let me say something quick about this. So you're looking for insect damage. What are you looking for? Bites, scrapes, yes, or holes in, in, in or on the plants. Okay, you're looking for slime trails. So if you have slugs and snails, and these are mostly active at night. So like on your callaloo, on your cucumber, on your tomato leaves, you can see slime trails. And you know that you have a slug problem. And then you can go and search for them when it is appropriate. If we had time, we could go into how we search for slugs and snails and get rid of them. But there are some home remedies like salt and ash that you can sprinkle around, or you can buy a commercial slug bait and put it around when you recognize that you have this problem. Signs of diseases, you are looking, going to be looking for crinkling leaves, discolored leaves, yes? Or leaves that are standing firm, but the, the, the veins, the entire leaf might not be discolored, but the veins in the leaves might be brownish or yellowish. Yep, and you recognize that generally this plant is not striving when it, because when, when it was striving a week or two weeks before. And so you reckon that you have a disease complex going on there. So understand as well that watering is very important, but we should not overwater or water too little the plants. So it should be moist. Some plants do not like when their leaves are wet, like tomatoes, yes. And so we should and and um we should recognize. Also that if we are overwatering by the roots, then the plant itself, every morning you might find water droplets on the tip of the leaves, yes? And if you check it out and this continues to happen for a week or two weeks, you might have the roots starting to rot because the soil is not well drained or you are so loving that you're killing the plants by watering it too often, okay? Some diseases as well thrive in wet conditions. So you should note that you should take particular care not to overwater your plants. Let me show you now some common garden pests that we often encounter. Um, so we often have aphids and these are little black, sometimes they are green or grayish on the underside of the leaves and you can squash them if they are not a many, yes. And this here um, on the right hand side, another picture of aphids. Yep. The other picture here on my left is a picture of white flies. It's 
easy to spot them because when you disturb the plants, you will see them flying around. And even in the morning, you will have some, some of these guys flying around. Um, there's another one that flies around that we call ensign scale as well. So we should look out for these and then decide what is the best course of action if we have these common garden pests coming up. And what we all know as well are stink bugs. I believe most of us know them. Stink bugs also a common garden pest that we should look out for because they will suddenly stop from the plants and even damage some of the fruits by piercing them and they look discolored and not very healthy. And then we have mealybugs. Mealybugs are so prevalent now that many of us don't even worry about it anymore if it's not overrunning the garden. But we should take particular care that we are not being, or plants are not being disadvantaged by a pest complex or we have several kinds of pests in the garden. Yes, mealybugs, a very interesting thing to look for are ants in and around your garden or on the plants when we have mealybugs. And the ants themselves will cause the mealybug to thrive. And if you thrive as well, because they will carry the small ones from plant to plant and thus spreading them. The mealybugs and aphids pro produce a sap that the ants feed on. And so they take care of each other in that regard. And then there are leaf miners that we should, we should look for tunnels in the leaves, yes? And then seek to get rid of these leaves as soon as possible in order to discourage the leaf miners from multiplying and eating out the chlorophyll in the plant leaves because you know it is the chlorophyll that the plants need to manufacture their food and a common that we all know are caterpillars right so having recognized now what are some common garden pests how do we deal with them my recommendation to the gardener who doesn't have an acre of plants yes or half an acre of plants is go out from day to day in your regular plant inspection, garden inspection, and look for these critters. And if you find three, four, six, you can easily squash them or shake them off and step on them. And so get rid of them. The first resort for us home gardeners who are practicing the organic way is not to spray. Yes, spraying is when you find that there's a certain threshold which you cannot physically handle and then you resort to spraying. And, and then that spraying, of course, is going to be used caref by carefully selecting the things that we know are safe to, be, to use, such as organic pesticides derived from naturally occurring sources. These include living organisms such as back, back, uh, the bacteria Bacillus thuringiensis, which is used to control caterpillar. And then we have some plant derives derivatives, derivatives such as pyrethrins from dried flower heads of chrysanthemum. We can use neem oil and pimento oil. And of course we can make our own little spray in the kitchen by mixing garlic and hot pepper and a little, a little oil and so forth and so on to, to, to make, sometimes we are, when we do this, we are not making something that will kill the plants, but it will act as a, as a repellent to prevent the plants from being infected or infested in the first place. Okay. Now, depending on your garden size, I was saying, I said before, pick off the bugs and damaged leaves, spray with insecticide, soap, onion, garlic, cayenne pepper. And if you go online, you will find various, you know, do it yourself, um, insecticide that you can make in your kitchen. What you can also do is to plant a variety of crops so that when one crop is affected or your six tomato plants are affected, then you know that the, 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 the beetroot is, will not be affected by the same pest, yeah? Or your corn might not be affected by the same pest. So you are doing what our grandparents did that we call subsistence farming, where on their little half an acre or two square, they are growing 10 different kinds of crops. So when one fail, the others are there to allow them to be reaped, to reap something. And then you can rotate your crops. I hinted on this before that crops feed at different layers in the soil. And there are some crops that 
produce um, well, fixed nitrogen that the plants need to grow. And so in rotating your crops, you are doing two things. You're not depleting the nutrients in the soil and you're not allowing a particular pest to build up to an unmanageable threshold in the area which you're doing your gardening. Okay, plant plants that repel pests, such as basil, dill chives, lemongrass, marigold, thyme, and petunias. So learn what they are and plant them at strategic locations in your garden. So, so, so when the pest comes, they will encounter these plants that will repel them and they will not go to your the plants that you want to be reaping your tomato and your cucumbers and, and, and your scallion and your different kinds of lettuce as well. Okay, now one thing to remember is that there are beneficial insects in your area and in your garden. So you need to know which bugs are which to, to look for because you want to keep these guys in your garden. Okay, such as the ladybugs, some ground beetles, and the pirate bugs, and the lacewigs, the praying mantis, um, dam damsel bugs, some of the dragon wasps, braconid wasps. We can learn what they are and learn what pests they repel. And when we are spraying or any management practice that we are doing and we see them, we should not kill them or do anything to dissuade, discourage them from being in your garden because they are actually there. God has put them there, as it were, to help your garden to remain healthy and thrive. So learn what they are and encourage them to be around. Matter of fact, in some, in some areas in the world, you can go and buy the, 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 the babies, the nymphs, yes, or the eggs of some of these, these beneficial insects and carry them into your garden and allow them to, grow, to, 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 to mature. And then you release them out in the garden to provide pest control. All right. So one of the very important thing to know is that sanitation, like you do around your house, in your kitchen, in your bathroom, or in your any living area, is very important. Similarly for your garden, sanitation is very important. You want to keep your garden clean from dead leaves and cuttings that you take off when you're doing your pruning, because these will encourage bacteria to grow in your garden and contaminate the soil. Because sometimes a plant might have a, a little mechanical damage, yes? And because you have an unsanitary condition in your garden, a secondary infection comes in because of those spots. Yeah, and your plant will not thrive. So get rid of your cuttings, clean up your garden ever so often and keep it looking nice and, and, and pretty as if you are living there. Okay, if you're going to be pruning your plants, for example, um, when I was pruning this, this bed of, um, of, of um, 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 par, um, my mind's running too fast now. When I was pruning this, I would make sure not to be using the same knife or scissors from this bed of plants to another bed. Yes, because I did not want to pass on any virus or bacteria from one area to the next. So plants from disease plots should not be put from one area to another. And many of us have a habit of getting plants from people and taking them into our garden, that is to be discouraged because sometimes we are carrying insect pests or we are carrying bacteria and virus into our garden without knowing it. So we shouldn't practice that. We love to do, some of us love to do that, which is not a very good practice. Sometimes we need to supply additional nutrients to the plants. Yes, we should apply properly composted organic manure around the roots and work it, work it into the soil. We can learn how to make a compost tea and use that to water the plants or even spray it on the leaves. And sometimes we need to supply additional nutrients like calcium using seaweed or egg shells or magnesium sulfate using Epsom salt. So these are just some of the ways in which we can add nutrients if we recognize that there's an issue with our plants. And what we love to do as I wrap up is harvest. 
quick mattering vegetable crops in your garden are ready to harvest about two months after you've, you've planted them. And there are some vegetables like arugula or some lettuce that can be ready in 30 days. And these are what we call cut and come again crops where you just cut the leaves and leave the plant growing there and it will produce another leaf. Yep, for you to use. The best thing to do is to harvest the items as close as possible to when you want to use them. Because as you remove a plant, a fruit or a vegetable from the plant, it starts to break down. Yep, and you want to have it as fresh as possible to get the maximum from it. So you're going to learn when it is the best time to harvest some of your fruits, because sometimes you will not see them ripening. They'll be very mature and ready and they'll be right. They'll ripen maybe in at 24, 48 hours after you have reaped them. Like for example, your breadfruit or your sauce up. You need to learn when it is best time to pick them or even your avocado. Yep, because sometimes if you allow some of these to ripen on the tree, you might not get them. Yes, or they might be at an area, an area where you can't reach them when you need to reach them. So the counselor is try to harvest them as close as possible, the time when you used to use them, when you need to use them, and when they are fully mature. And with that, I hope I have equipped you, yes, to do your little home garden, whether you have a space outside where you can make a square foot garden, or you can get some pots and pans and buckets or buy some nice pretty flower pots and plant your vegetables in them. Thank you very much for listening. And I remain available whether here or if you want to contact me through Dr. Chung to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Elder White, how educational this has been. It has been really and truly very educational and you're sure that you'll be hearing from us again because we <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only person who enjoyed learning so much that there are some insects that are so beneficial and there are others that we need to look out from get rid of those and what type of material to use I've learned so much I think my head is overwhelmed at this moment <laughs> the amount of information I've just put into it so I know that we will be having you again on your health and you we have truly enjoyed your presentation and hold on i'm sure there are some questions Andrew, what are the viewers saying any questions any comments i am seeing comments no questions just yet but if you have questions those of you who are watching or listening uh elder Bay, elder white rather is with us so you can put your questions in the chat let me share some of the comments i'm seeing dr chong so Joy Charles from Tobago. Welcome, Sister Joy. Happy to have you. She says, I love backyard gardening. This presentation will be giving me the help I need to be successful in my gardening. Thank you. I also see Maxine Anderson saying, great information. Jennifer Richards from New Mexico saying, quite informative. And I'm seeing some questions coming in, Dr. Chung. And also another comment before I ask the question. Maxine Anderson says, very informative. I'm definitely going to watch on the replay. And the question I'm seeing is from Nicole Mozart. She's asking, why did my string bean plants dry up? Well, Nicole, that can be a number of reasons. Um, if it was a healthy plant to begin with, and it was bearing, blossoming, producing fruits, and you never had it for three or four months, then what you could do is to just pull out the roots from the soil and look whether the root has an infection. Yep. And, and if it's a a slimy looking infection, if you, if you rub your fingers on it, then that could be a bacteria or a fungal problem. If, it's, if the leaves are crinkled, yes, and look mosaic, then that could be a viral problem. So there's a number of things. And um, I don't know how techy you are, but there are many sites now where you can send pictures of what you're encountering. 
and these experts will give you um, an idea of what the issue is. I hope I was helpful. Okay, thanks for your response, Elder. I'm seeing another question. This one is from Elaine Bryan. If, if we don't have sand, can compost alone be used? Yes, indeed. Yes, yes. The compost is nice and loose and it runs through your finger when you take it up and it has no odor. That is, it is well composted and you can't know what was in it, maybe except for some um, seeds that, that are there. You can't know that it was banana and plantain and yam and apple peel and all those things. It's properly composted. Of course, you can use it. Just make sure not to compact it too much. Uh, and because you need to have the ear pockets in it so that the, the, the microbes can move through it and be happy. Yes. All right, happy plants indeed. Yeah, Sister. Oh, sure. Yes, Dr. Cho. I, I have a question for you. If I go into my garden and I just dig up some soil, how can I tell if the soil can be used to to, to, to do my planting, what, what do I look for to say, yes, I can use it or no, it's not good enough. I know I need to add compost, but otherwise, how do I know that, that if the soil is good enough? Okay, what you want to look for is if you, if you have a big enough piece and you look to see the worm holes in it, yes, then you can know that is a good soil. You want to know it's not a tough, hard piece of clay Big, you know how clay is something when, when it gets very hard, it's hard to break up. Now, if your water is not optim optimally being done, then the clay will get so hard that it restricts the movement of this of the roots in it. And if you're planting tubers like potato, yes, or and and um, um beetroot and carrot and stuff like that, then the clay will restrict the size of what you're getting. Yep. And you want to, if it is nice and dark brown then you know that it has a lot of organic matter in it and it is good to use. So those are just some of the basics that you want to look for. All right. So Heather Fletcher has a comment as well as a question. Her comment is excellent presentation. And her question is, can you sterile the pruning tool to be used? Sterilize. Of course, you can sterilize the pruning tool to be used. Yes. Um, you could walk with a, a bleach spray bottle on your, if you have a little desk or table in your garden or just hang it on your belt and you can spray it in between moving from one plant to another plant and that will work. Yes. Okay. We have another question and this is from Debbie Ann Armstrong. She's says you are saying that we ought to desist from practicing taking plants from others, but in case we do that, how can we treat with that? Oh, well, it would, if you know where it is coming from and you can look at the parent plant, yes, or, or, if, or, or, or the plants in and around the area, uh, you can see whether or not it is coming from an area where there were not lots of white flies and aphids around, yeah? And, or if the plant, say it's a tomato plant, yes, a tomato seedling, whether the mother plant or the plants around had any diseased leaves on them. What we need to remember is plant viruses, there are no cure for plant viruses. If a plant has a viral disease, there's no cure for it, yep? What, what happens in, in the industry that they plant resistant varieties to, to that virus if they can find it, yes? If it's a bacterial problem, very often it is because there is unsanitary condition somewhere around, yeah? And you can deal with that. Could be in the water, yes? Or it could be that the plants were damaged somewhere or because you might have used um, on on decomposed material in and around the garden. Uh, and, and so we need to just be mindful of where the plants are coming from and what is the environmental condition in, in the area where it is coming from. Okay. Marcia Christopher is asking, how would you know which plant would need more water or less water? 
Okay. Um, well, if you, if you, the plants that are succulent, like your kalalu, yes, and your, your, your um, okra and stuff like that, those need, and your pumpkin, they need a lot of water. Yeah. And so you will make sure that you're not giving the, the, the pumpkin and the okra and the kalalu the same amount of water you're giving to say your gungo peas, if you have a gungo peas plant. Like the gungo peas, they have different root systems. Some is, so like the gungo peas has a root system where it has one central root that goes into the soil and then other roots radiate or off of it. That's called a top root system. Now that plant wouldn't require as much water as your, 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 your tomato in a pot and so forth and so on. So you just need to pay attention to that. Also, you need to make sure that in this, not on a slope because gravity itself will cause the water to move down slope, yes? So those plants on the slope will need more water than others that are in a level area, okay? And, and in your pot as well, if your pot has many holes in it, then you might need to water those plants a little more than the pot that has one or two holes in it, all right? And, and I would challenge you to research on the, 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 the parts of the containers now that you can water or like maybe once every three days and it retains the moisture in it because of how the, the container is designed. So you don't have to worry about watering over and over and it doesn't take up, it doesn't allow the plant to get too much water to damage the plant as well. Okay, Dr. Chung, uh, do we have time for two more questions? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Elaine Brand is asking, why did my breadfruit plant take so long to start taking root? It's been about two months since I took it off the big tree and it's not putting out any leaves. Any leaves or any roots? Um, I am I am guessing that what she did was to cut off a piece of the root that maybe I was running near to the surface and plant that somewhere else. I I'm just guessing now, not understanding the question clearly. Um, but what what normally happens is that you need to mimic the environment where it is coming from as best as you can because plants suffer shock when you move them from one place to another place yes and so if you can mimic the environment where they are coming from as best as you can then they'll be more comfortable and and bounce back from the shock easier yep or as well as the environment in which you have them it might be too hot Yes, or too windy, and that will hamper its 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 um adjustment to the new area and start and and start growing. So I I'm I'm guessing you took up a small plant from a big plant that was running near to the surface, or you had a root cutting and you're trying to root that. Okay. And Yvonne Moore is asking, how do you get rid of white flies on your plants? Okay, now the gardener like yourself, the DIY gardener like you and myself is, you can use soap water. Now there are some soaps that have less um, chemicals in them, like um, Castile, if you can get Castile liquid soap. And the soap that they use for babies, newborns, these soaps have less chemical in them and this is easy to, to just mix maybe um, a teaspoon to uh, um, a, a liter of water and spray the white fly with that. If you, can, if you can do that maybe three or four mornings or evenings, you don't want to spray your plants when it is very hot and sunny, you might be able to get rid of them. And um, one thing with white flies though is that normally, they are not just on your plant, they might be on your neighbor's plant or on a wild a plant that is growing out in the bushes and you don't even recognize it. So you might have to scout around, yes, to see where and where the pest is and try to deal with all those places at the same time. Or you might just be fighting a losing battle 
because you don't recognize the other places that they are reservoir for the pest out in the wild or in your neighbor's yard and so forth and so on. And everybody needs to be doing the same thing at the same time to get rid of the white flies. But it's very hard to get rid of white flies, particularly if, as I said, your neighbors have them. You can be spraying from now till next week and you will just seeing a minimal. Also, if you, if you learn the life cycle of the white fly based on the adults that you're seeing and the babies that you're seeing, you can guesstimate when a new generation will be, will be, will be produced and try to nip it in the bud when the new generation is very, very young. One thing that you might resort, you must resort to doing is to get rid of the plants that they are on. If they are on a particular plant in your garden, yeah? And just start over with that particular plant. Okay. Elder, do you do home garden visits? That's a question coming from Nicole Mozart. I really have never done this. When my friends come, they look at my garden, and they ask questions. I say, okay, when you go back, you do this or you do that. Yes. Okay. But if it is nearby, yes, of course, I would I would gladly help. All right. And uh, Sandra is asking, can you put house plants outside? Yes. What and you actually you need to be doing that, putting your house plants outside. I know if you have had the presentation here on plants that purify the air. I, I, I do that a couple of times already, and I've, I did that even last month for church. Uh, what you need to do is to have those host plants, or even the plants that you have in your church, they need to go outside in the sun, yes, even once a week, because they need to be getting the sunlight on the leaves, yes, to be producing the food that they need, and also to help them to be strong and healthy, yep. So you need to put your house plant outside, not sometimes not in the, the very hot sun because it will burn the leaves, but what you want to do is to introduce it to the sunlight gradually or let it stay somewhere outside where it gets maybe three or four hours of, of, of the not so very hot sun before you put it back inside. Because being inside for a long time, it will start what they call stretching, going, looking for the sunlight, yes? Uh, as well as it will start, um, the, the color might not look so nice and lush as it was in the beginning because it lacks sunlight. Okay. Oh, no, unfortunately, Anjui. All and right. Thank you, Edward. Thank you so much. This has been truly, truly, truly interesting. My pleasure. And we look forward to being with you again when you call. I will answer. Bye-bye. All right, Dr. Chung. I think it is time for another celebrations video. So we'll take that right now. Celebrations belief. Everyone believes in something. Believing is natural. It happens every day in plenty of situations and often goes unnoticed. You might say that the survival of all humans is based on beliefs of some kind. Research has found significant benefits to religious belief. A study of Americans who reached the age of 100 found that religiosity enhanced their health. Although many questions remain unanswered, it's clear that the benefits of trusting in God result from more than simply attending religious services. Belief is also linked to quality of life. It increases life satisfaction and personal happiness and is associated with fewer negative psychological consequences due to traumatic life events. Trusting in a loving, powerful God gives you the ability to enjoy a healthful lifestyle as he fills your life with abundant peace and joy. Hello everyone, in Psalm 104 verse 14, God says that he has given the earth for the service of man so that man can go about his labor. In essence, he says that the vegetables that we eat will keep us healthy. Welcome to another in the series, Your Health and You. And today, I'm going to show you how to 
jazz up your vegetable a little more. Sometimes we don't, don't just want to just eat the vegetable like that. You want to add something to it that will give you the health benefit, but still taste a little different. So I am making, we call it olive oil lettuce salad. All right, and olive oil come because of the olives that we will be using, and the O is for the onion that will be in it, our red sweet onion, and of course the lettuce, okay? So let's go. So this is a lettuce that was washed and shredded. We use our hands to sh shred it because that way you will retain more nutrients, okay? We try not to use any metal with our vegetables. Okay, and then I am adding, this is one small onion that we had um, sliced thinly. We are adding that to it. Okay, no, your red onion, they're very, they're very tasty. They're, they're sweet by nature and therefore they don't have the kind of zest that you'd find in the normal white onion. Okay, but they are packed with antioxidants, which is fight against cancer and um, free radicals that will try to scavenge our body okay and then to that i am adding this is half cup of uh, olives now olives are excellent for your kidneys anyone who have kidney problem kidney problem should be taking olives because it's excellent for that and if you don't have the problem please take it so that you don't end up with the problem all right so I'm adding these three together and we are going to be mixing them around so that they can be well incorporated. Now, as you mix them around, what will happen is that lettuce is, is about like 90% water. So whatever you put with it, tend, it tend to pick up the taste of that thing, all right? So when you're working it in, what will happen, it will pick up the flavor from the red onion. So don't be too quick to just put it in and go. Work it in so that the flavor can be distributed, okay? So that's the three of them. But I know you will not want to just eat it like that. We always ask for a dressing. No, remember something about your dressing. When you're using a food that, is, that has high water content, let the dressing be very simple. If you do a, a, a very heavy dressing with it, then you're going to slow down the digestion of the water uh, soluble vegetable or food. All right? So you want to make a simple dressing. And in this, I can just tell you what I have because it's so, so simple. I put a tablespoon of honey, one eighth teaspoon of pink Himalayan salt, all right? I put two tablespoons of lemon juice, and I put a piece of, well, I blended a piece of onion, the same red onion with those, and this is what comes out, all right? Beautiful, you're just going to put it over there. All right, and once again, you're going to work it in. The beautiful thing about the lettuce is that by the time, within, within 30 seconds, it picks up the flavor. So when you're eating it, and this is my secret of getting the children to eat um, the, the raw vegetables, all right? So you, you just put it down. If you have more time, you can put it down for a longer time, but at least for 30 seconds, not even a minute, and it would have been incorporated because of osmosis that's taking place in it, okay? And your finished product, let me put it in a plate so that you can see what our finished product looks like. And this is our olive oil lettuce salad. Lettuce salad, okay? This is a healthy, filling, good way to start your meal, all right? And you'll get the nutritional value while at the same time, very tasty. God bless you. Hello, 
everyone, welcome to another Your Health and You. Today I will be making carob cake or chocolate alternative cake. All right, so I'm just going to go straight into it. So I'm using a combination of gluten-free flour. So I have a cup of um, unbleached organic flour, one cup. This is almond flour, one cup. And this one is coconut flour, so it's all gluten-free. Okay, then I'm going to be adding some dry ingredients. And this is my carob, and this is an ounce of carob powder. Um, this is an alternative to baking powder or baking soda. It is called calcium carbonate. It works similarly, um, but with, without the nasty side effects of the baking powder. And we know that Spirit of Prophecy uh, counsels against the use of baking powder. Okay, so I'm just gonna give it a little stir. Okay. Now, for the oil, I'm going to be using coconut oil. And this is cold press and organic. Okay, so I call this, this is half a cup. I'm not gonna put everything all at once. I'm gonna put, leave back a little bit. I'm trying to avoid using too much grease. That's another counsel we get from Spirit of Prophecy that we should use these things as minimally as possible. This is also a cup of honey. And so we're trying to get things as natural as possible. So I'll pour most of it, but not all. At the end, if, it's, if it needs more sugar, I will add the extra. Okay, so I'll leave this. For my flavorings, I am using vanilla bean paste. This is natural. It was not processed with all alcohol. And we know that most vanilla extracts are processed with alcohol. So this is another natural alternative to your alcohol processed vanilla. i put a little bit more. The thing with the vanilla, when you add that to the carob, it makes the carob taste very much like chocolate. Okay, i leave that. So I poured in about a tablespoon. And I'm gonna put a little drop of organic wild orange essential oil just to enhance the flavor i put a little dash of salt and a little bit of water and this is purified water by the way I give it a stir now to get the right consistency. And we stir away. We stir and we stir. The more you stir also is the more air you incorporate to make it as light as possible. So I'll add a little more water. Thank you. Right. It's getting to the consistency that I desire. Now I'm gonna have a taste of this to see if it has the desired flavor. I'm looking for a dropping consistency. 
not as soft as a runny consistent, a pouring consistency, just in between dropping and, and pouring. Is the desired consistency I'm looking for and so that's the end of the mixing now this pan is already pre-greased so I'm gonna just put this into it and just to let you know this same recipe that we use for the cake can also be used for making your muffin and also your cookies and so you can get the children involved in this in the process of making those because children tend to like cookies and muffins so that's one way of getting children involved in the fun all right i just smooth this over so that when it comes out the top of it is quite smooth hi again after baking the cow cake for 40 minutes at 360 degrees i'm now going to complete it with a cow glaze and then garnish it with some ground nuts now the carob glaze, it looks just like chocolate, as you can see. And the ingredients in, in this is um, a little bit of coconut oil, extra virgin organic, cold pressed, and uh, um, carob powder, a few ounces, about an ounce and something of carob powder, and a few drops of wild orange essential oil. That is the secret ingredient in there also a um, few drops of vanilla bean paste and it tastes perf like perfect chocolate you won't miss chocolate at all now i'm going to pour this on and then i spread it all right let's go This carob would have tasted, cake would have tasted so ordinary without this really tasty carob glaze. Okay, nearly done, nearly there. And now for the nuts, the ground nut garnish, I'll just sprinkle this around the edge. your carob in your smoothie in your shakes in your ice cream to sprinkle on your ice cream or your mousse and I'm talking about plant-based products here now and um, in your cookies and your muffins etc so here is the finished product <laughs> It is now time for intercessory prayer. The prayer requests that have been placed in the chat will now be attended to as Sister Lorna Davis will go ahead with our intercessory prayer.
Thanks be to God. I have not seen any prayer requests in the chat for the Zoom. Mr. Chung, I don't know if there's on YouTube. Any requests? If so, could you let me know, please? I think there were, there were a few in, in the YouTube chat. Yes, there were a few in the YouTube chat. I don't know, if, are you able to access them? No. But I... Could I just pray a general prayer? You may go ahead. For those requests? Yes. Okay, amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we pause to give you thanks for taking us safely through another beautiful day, through another interesting session of enlightenment on how to live healthy lives. Thank you for the teachings of those whom you have blessed in areas of life as this. Help us, mighty God, not just to sit and listen, but that we will rise to the occasion and be practical in order to develop and care for our bodies so that we can be energized to serve you and to serve others. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the speakers and for the knowledge acquired and the ability to expound to us, to us such knowledge. Thank you, Father. And now, Lord, some of your children you know are sick and in despair, oftentimes, Lord, because of improper diet. We lift up such ones to you tonight because you control all the parts of our bodies and you know when they are not working at their best. Sickness leaves us stressed, Father. Sickness steals time from us and from all the things we want to be doing. So please, I petition your throne tonight to touch your people and help us, Lord, to eat right. Thank you that you love us with an everlasting love. I know that you hate what illness is doing to your children. So I ask in the name of Jesus that you will heal diseases, that you will have compassion and bring healing to all sicknesses, Lord. Your word in Psalm 107 tells us that when we call out to you, the earth eternal one, you will give us the order. In the Bible, we're also told about miraculous healing, and we believe that you still heal the same way today. We bless the name, Lord. I believe that there is no sickness you cannot heal after us. There's no sickness, Lord, you, can, you cannot heal because the Bible tells us of you raising people from the dead. So I ask you that irrespective of our inconsistencies in the way we eat, I ask, Lord, for your divine intervention into these situations. But help us to understand, help us to understand, Lord, that you will help those who help themselves. So help us to listen and to learn and to eat right. Forgive us, almighty God, of our shortcomings, I pray. And may your peace that passes all understanding continue to reign with us. Remember, oh God, we know that you know, you sit high and you look, no, you, you look low upon the children of men and you know the desires of the hearts of each and every one of us because you know us 
even more than we know our, our very selves. So I petition your throne tonight, Lord God, that you'll help us, God, to be wise, help us to ask for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding more and more each day so we can do the right things, oh God, which is according to your will that we will eat the right things, Lord, that we will listen to those who you have given the knowledge. And, oh God, that as we go from day to day, all of us lives will be better. We pray for healing those who made requests, Lord. We pray that you will just visit with each and with every one of them and help them to know that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. What you have done in the past, God, you will do it again. So I pray that you'll search every heart and grant us, Lord, the desires of, your, of our hearts according to your will, as I beg and ask these and other mercies in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. And I know that the particular prayer requests were not mentioned in this prayer that we aired, but the prayer team is lifting up every single request. And of course, God has seen every single one of them. And he is a prayer answering God. And we, we have come to the end of yet another interesting program. I would like to commend all our presenters. I'd like to commend our host, Mrs. Angelis James Sawyers for an excellent program yet one more time. Thank you, Dr. Chong. And thanks for moderating as well. An excellent job with that. And I just want to, before we go, we have some announcements that I wanna share with us. House of Prayer Experience happens this Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. And we encourage you to join us for another Your Health and You. St. Catherine will be leading out in that program and it will be on Monday, May 16. So mark that on your calendars and we start at 7 p.m. And the topic will be Dental Care and You. And for those persons who would like to make contact with Elder White for further information or consultation, you can send him an email at h-o-d-i-j-a-h at hotmail.com. And you can put as a subject for that email, holistic gardening. And we want to ensure that your email does not go into his junk. So we encourage you to put the subject holistic gardening. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks to Palm SDA, Octon Betty SDA, Shady Grove SDA, and the rest of you who joined us for our program this evening. We are so happy to have you. Keep safe, stay healthy. And we'll see you again next time. God bless you.